We're with Paul Draper. He's the director of the theater program at Sonoma State University. Is that the official title, director of the theater program? I'm actually the director of the acting program. We do have a chair for the department, but and there are directors for four different areas in theater ah, arts. See, yeah. this is interesting. Okay, yeah. so there's theater proper, theater, genus, and then yeah. the species you've got is acting. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Theatrical right. acting. How does it differ from what we know now as uh, you know film acting and that kind of thing? What has changed? Well, I think primarily is that the examples that young actors have of what is a good actor come from them watching film and television. Right. And we're used to saying things and then having the editing room determine the pace of the scene. You take a scene several times and then they cut it in. Like viewers don't know, we've edited this four different times now. <laughs> this conversation between you and me, and exactly, now, it's, yeah. now it's clearly perfection. Taking but. out all the, all the salty language. <laughs> right. That's right. So I think that's the main thing, and, and young actors, when they're on stage, they have, to, they have to define the pace of the scene because they're live, and they're used to seeing people taking pauses, and during the pause, the camera shifts from one face to another, from one thing to another, and they can afford the pause. On stage, they don't have that time. Right. The audience will go to sleep very quickly, and uh, or, or think something's say, wrong, or think something wrong, or yeah. think you dropped your line, something yeah. like that. So I think that's the main thing. And the other thing has to do with size, is that on uh, on camera, on camera, um, <laughs> every little thing is picked up by the camera. The the the, the cliche: the camera never lies. Mm -hmm. It's also true that the human eye doesn't lie, and when it sees an actor being truthful on stage. Uh, the audience recognizes that, but I think it's easier for a young actor to think, I can bluster, I can bluff, I can be um, large, or I can be very small and pretend I'm in front of a camera and the audience won't notice, but in fact the audience does. So finding that balance between truthfulness and size and presence, that's the, that's the main thing that I think a, a stage actor has to find. And that's... That's, those are habits, I think, they acquire that you have to help work them through. Sure. This. I'm sure that uh, the habits that a um, 19th century or early 20th century actor had came from watching other stage performers. The uh, uh, current actors, the habits they have come from watching tel television and, uh, and movies. And so working them through that is a big, is a big challenge. So theatrical acting, I would imagine, is an necessarily striving for realism? Well, I think realism is a real tough word to talk about. It's kind of a style of theater. I would say that uh, all theater is striving to be truthful in an imaginary mm -hmm. circumstance. So whether you're doing a, 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 I wouldn't call a musical, a realistic play. Fair enough, yeah. But you have to be truthful to the material. You have to be truthful to the song. You have to be truthful to the circumstance. If you're doing a play that is more typically realistic like Chekhov or Arthur Miller or, or someone like that, you have to be truthful to it, but we think of that as realistic. Yeah. Even Steve Carroll in, a, in you know, the, the Office, you have to be realistic and truthful to the material. That's a great observation. Yeah. There's a cute turn of phrase I like to use, which is uh, sort of like one of those SAT uh, analogy questions, so, you know, like, uh, plot is to fact as truth is to story, right? And it seems to me that uh, theatrical, act, the, theatrical acting is, is in that realm of, of pure story, and, and that, that truth is something that you're trying to get your actors to find. Now, you direct them as well. I do, yeah. yeah. And uh, do you find that when you're working with them on stage, do you ever rue, uh, like, oh, I should have taught them more, or is it still a learning experience for them? <laughs> There's a very big difference between working with experienced actors and working with college actors. But I think there's pluses and minuses on both sides. Um, young, young actors are so gung-ho, they haven't been through the experience of being told no a lot in audition. Mm -hmm. They haven't been uh, cheated out of a paycheck yet. Uh, they're very hopeful and so they're very willing to try it, to, to try it. And I think some experienced actors coming with um, knowing how to do it already, right. which is shorthand, you don't have to teach them how to cross the stage, you don't have to teach them to project or to make sure their face is seen in right. the camera. Um, that makes the rehearsal period shorter, quicker, more efficient, 
but also I think sometimes you get a little bit of jadedness. Interesting. But yeah. Now you've worked professionally with with a lot of yeah. actors, and uh, I, I was looking at all the plays you've uh, directed, which are, I mean, it's an endless list. Uh, ending with, at least in the version I saw, Marie and Bruce by Wallace Shawn, which I, a play I quite like. Believe it or not, that was my first professional show. Oh, they was, flipped it, didn't they? they yes, uh, <laughs> Damn it, John. It was, <laughs> but, it was many, many years ago in yeah. Chicago. Yeah. 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 So, so working in that milieu, you know, is it one of those deals where, as a as an uh, an instructor, you are still learning your craft as well, and or? Oh, certainly. Yeah. I, 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 the, the more I do it, the more I appreciate that it's it's my students who are teaching me. Right. They're teaching me how to get through to them. They're teaching me what the sensibility of the current time is. Uh, I'm I'm many years older than most of my students, mm -hmm. all of my students, I should say. And they're teaching me how I need to talk to them, and I'm teaching them what's in the material. It's always got to be a conversation, and uh, I think when I was younger, it was like, do it the way I want it, but then I wouldn't get as satisfying a result. Right. If I say, this is the parameter, this is the game we're in, you find your way into it, they light up at that, they're like, you want my opinion? No, it's more than your opinion. Mm -hmm. It's it's your soul that needs to be in this, and I don't, I'm not your soul. You don't soul. have a soul. <laughs> no, I've been in the business, so. Right. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was going to say, uh, in as much as uh, your students are teaching you, you should probably never tell that to the financial aid office. That would just screw the whole program up. That's now. right. That's, <laughs> or they'll start charging me for my own right. classes. That's right. So, so in terms of like uh, tapping students' awareness of what's contemporary and happening in theater, what have you learned from them? Uh, how has it changed since you went pro? Is theater that dynamic that it's always changing? Well, I, uh, I, I think theater is a kind of, it is what it is. I mean, you have a, an audience out there, they're live, they're breathing. Mm -hmm. You have to respond to them in real time. Um, whether you're in a huge house, like a 1,400-seat uh, a big house, or whether you're in uh, a black box theater that seats 50 people, you still have to deal with that live entity, the the audience. So it, I wonder, is it theater that's changed, or has the audience changed, and their expectations of what theater is? I think the audiences have changed quite a bit. I think uh, what audiences expect is a level of professionalism that perhaps you, uh, when I was starting out, I was like, well, we expect you to be live theater uh, or, or actors. We don't expect you to have the perfect prop all the time. We don't mm -hmm. think um, every hem has to be sewed up. But what you see on camera in in film and television is so is so clean right. that I think that it layers a, a, a kind of expectation on the audience. That being said, I think you, uh, young actors, a, any actor bringing an audience into a story, they will skip over some of that sort of clean professionalism and mm -hmm. say, thank you for taking me along. And they lower their, in, the, in a way, they lower the expectation for... Um, or maybe they forgive a bit, you know? Well, I'm not even sure it's forgiving. I think they kind of just say, I'm so involved in the show. I was working on, uh, we just closed the production of Hamlet, and someone in the prop department said, can it be this or can it by that? Can it be that? And I said, either is fine. I think the audience won't notice, and if they do, it won't make any difference because they're paying attention to the wrong thing. If they're paying attention to the actors and they're paying attention to the drama, they won't know whether the piece of paper is parchment or <laughs> something out of a <laughs> Xerox machine. In fact, it was something out of a Xerox machine, and no <laughs> one said anything about it. <laughs> That's great. <It's> just fine. <laughs> We're talking with Paul Draper. He's the director of the acting department at Sonoma State University, and we'll, we'll be right back. And we're back with Paul Draper. He's the director of the acting department at Cinema State University. Uh, we left off talking about where uh, uh, audiences, if they're paying, att paying attention to the right thing, they're not going to notice the wrong thing, it, be it photocopy, paper versus parchment or whatever. Um, you got the right thing, though. You got a diploma on parchment, presumably. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hopefully not a photocopy on your wall in your office. Uh, uh, from uh, uh, 
Columbia, am I right? Columbia University. Yeah. yeah. Let's let's go back in time and talk about that experience. So what, what years were you there studying theater arts? I was there in the mid 80s. Uh, I think I started my program in 85 and completed in 88. And that's a really yeah. dynamic time for theater, especially in that, that area. Oh, so Off much. Off Broadway was happening, like really beginning to... It was great. It was yeah. huge. And uh, one of the things in my program is um, we had a connection with the Schoenfelds. Okay. So Friday afternoons, um, we'd go down to the Schubert uh, Alley offices of the Schoenfelds, and we would just chat with Bernie Jacobs and Bernie Solins. We just, wow. we just talk. So for, um, for the audience uh, not hip to the Schoenfelds, who are they? Uh, I'm sorry, it's uh, uh, um, Jerry Schoenfeld and um, Bernie Jacobs. They were the top producers for the Schoenfeld uh, for the um, for the Schubert organization at the time. That's great. So, well, why I mean, acting then? Why? What what drew you there? Well, I actually, when I went to graduate school, I went as a as a director, okay. um, and my program actually didn't have an acting program associated with they they trained. Um, directors and playwrights right. and managers and the vision of the program at the time it's changed now that now they have a full-fledged acting program mm -hmm. was that there are hundreds of actors in New York you'll find the actors but it's very easy for a writer or a director to get swamped in a program where there are hundreds of actors right. and a handful of directors so it was a very strong vision we got to work with some really top top professional uh, directors and writers and actors in uh, in New York. Mm -hmm. We were exposed to what was going on for everybody from Robert Wilson to Joanne Acolytus uh, uh, to Jerry Zaks. We were exposed to really good work at the time and we were challenged enormously in the in the classroom. My, uh, my second year project was to take a Shakespeare play we had one hour, they said you can have 60 minutes, you can't have 61, and you can't have 59, <laughs> essentially. But you have to do every scene in the play. Wow. Well, that's did, a challenge. Did you reinterpret the scenes? These are five-act plays usually. Were you able to cut and chop? Well, and we had to. Yeah. I, I had to uh, so take it wasn't just scene. fast? It was just <laughs> no, no, it wasn't fast. I suppose you could do it that way. But um, it was cutting lines, it was, but you couldn't cut a scene. So. Right. A scene might be just a cross, but you had to convey in the cross the meaning of the entire scene. And that was a tremendous challenge. And another aspect of it was we didn't have designers. So they hooked us up with the um, School of Architecture, and they would assign a student, a graduate student in architecture nice. to design our set. They taught us about space, and they taught us about not thinking about the convention of the theater. And we taught them about you have to work with time. Right. You only have this amount of time. And it was a tremendous collaboration, uh, the, one of the best experiences I've had. And so when it comes to theater directing, yeah, given what you've learned, what, what, w is it an interpretive art? Is it a form unto itself? I would say so. Yeah. Uh, there, are, there are people who say directors are there to serve the project, to serve the writer. That they're technicians sometimes. Yeah. To some degree. Yeah. But I, I, I think if, you, if you're not interpreting, then you're not really in the room. You have to mm -hmm. make choices. And I always thought, well, you could do a production of, you know, um, of Macbeth with five different directors and have each one of them do a different act, and you would see how different directors approach the same material. Right. My job as, an act, as a director is to allow the audience to see the world as I see it. I have to work with actors, mm -hmm. I, have, I work with designers, um, I work with producers, and we collectively shape it, but I've got to be the person who says this is the way we're going. So it seems though, in that regard, it's almost like the auteur theory of cinema. So in as much as there's a presumption that the play is the thing, right? So it's mm -hmm. a writer's medium. Theater's a writer's medium to a degree, or there's a perception at least that I've developed that, sure. that it is. And then film, uh, you know, at least in the 60s and 70s, kind of turned that around and said, well, these are the raw materials, but it's the director's vision ultimately, right? It seems like you're in that kind of space where, yes, the play is a thing, and here are some actors, but now here is a vision that I am going, I'm using these elements to, to project through or with. Well, I, I think whether you, if you're working with an, uh, an old play where the playwright isn't around, 
um, you don't have access to that brain, right. that creativity. If you're working with a live writer who's in the room, you have certain obligations. I. They may so, now also have a brain, though. That happens. <laughs> <laughs> I've never met one like that. But, I mean, I say to my students, you owe the writer their lines. Right. You can't change their lines. You can't say, I'm going to interpolate this or drop it or rewrite that. Mm -hmm. You owe them what they put into it. They've organized the material. They have something to say. They're trying to convey certain themes, and they're doing it with language. They're doing it with character. They're doing it with a lot of technique. And it's not for me to say, hey, that doesn't count. Right. Then I would be the writer. And I think that's the distinction between an auteur director, someone who, uh, who essentially rewrites the material in their own image, someone I would call Joan Acolytus uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, an auteur director. Um, I don't think I'm in that vein. Um, but neither am I in the vein that says, I don't have any choices to make here. Right. I think that the, the director has to make choices and has to have an idea of what this production will be. And uh, um, the newer the play, the more you have to follow the lead of the director, I mean the, uh, the writer. Right, because that's all you've got to work with. That's right. Yeah. And, yeah. and you can destroy a play that's a beautiful play if you're not listening to the writer. Down the road, after the play has had its life, maybe you say, well, there's, there are other ways to do it. But, you know, Shakespeare will survive me, and even my productions of Shakespeare. There are no penal codes there, so I think you have a little mm -hmm. more leeway when the writer is not around to complain. I think you have less leeway when you're working with a living, breathing playwright, and hopefully you have a good relationship with that playwright, and are saying, what do you want to see here? And if you disagree or have a problem with that, you go out for a cup of coffee and say, could the scene work this way? Or could the scene work that way? Or there might be too much language, or there might be something that's, that you want to say, but it doesn't feel uh, fleshed out textually yet. And then that becomes a whole different kind of creative process there. It's a collaboration at that it's point. It's collaboration, yeah. yeah. Out of uh, the living playwrights uh, whose material, material you've worked with, or otherwise, who do you admire right now? Who do I admire? Hmm. That's what I thought. <laughs> now, <laughs> of the living writers. So, yeah. Well, um, I like uh, Naomi Wallace a lot. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's, um, uh, we did a production of uh, the Tressel of Popla Creek a couple years ago, and I like that. Um, you caught me off guard on that one. Yeah, no worries. Be honest with that. So. Hey, so back back in Chicago, where you're from, we talked a little bit about that during the break. There was a real dynamic theater thing also happening in the '80s. I'm thinking Steppenwolf and that kind of stuff. Why why New York versus Chicago? Well, when I I, I went to Northwestern, and it's just natural to drift from Evanston down to Chicago and start getting work, mm -hmm. um, and that's what I did. Um, at a certain point, I realized that. I much preferred being in rehearsal than I did being in a run of a show. Mm. That the creative work of working with others, of coming up with ideas, of working with a writer, seeing what's in the material, that was very satisfying to me. And also, uh, I wanted to make all the choices. I didn't want to just <laughs> like, I, I'll do the choices of this character. I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to have influence on the whole on the whole picture, and that meant that, and I used to argue with directors, and I realized that my arguing with directors was me saying, I want to be that. Yeah. And it was very unfair to, my, to the directors I was working with, and they let me know that I was not being um, fair to them. When I stepped back and said, oh, uh, I don't want to be an actor, I want to be a director, and when I started directing, mm -hmm. it, and realized that that was the thing that was really driving me, then I could go back into a situation as an actor and I had no problem with the director saying, could you try it this way? I just stopped fighting that. That's good. I would got to be a better actor and I said, well, I'd better pursue my career and I went off to New York to get a degree in directing. So we'll pick up on that in the next bit. Okay. We're talking with Paul Draper. He's the director of the acting department at Cinema State University. We'll be right back on 707. <laughs> Thank you.
And we're back with Paul Draper, and this time I'm going to get his title right. He is the director of the acting program in the Department of Theater Arts and Dance at Cinema State University. I want to make that clear to everyone. That's actually what's happening. He is not the Pope of stage work. Sorry, I don't know where <laughs> I got that before. But okay, I see here you did Amadeus as well. You know, John played Salieri once. I'm uh, not surprised. Amazing. He'd be great in that. He role. was great. He was yeah. great. He's really good at envy and simmering anger. <laughs> <laughs> so, besides the title I kept butchering in the previous two segments, you are also the director of sustainability at Cinema State University. I am. What is the director of sustainability, and how do you how do you direct an abstract concept like that on stage? Well, uh, <laughs> first of all, it, it's totally outside of the realm of theater, yeah. um, and it's a bit of a misnomer. Nobody directs sustainability. Right. I don't think anybody directed us into climate degradation. <laughs> I think it happened through a series of um, human choices, right. some of which were quite strong. I mean, moving into the industrial age was a necessity. Yeah. Um, moving into cars versus public transportation systems. Yeah. Uh, life expense expectancy went from 40 years to 85, 90 years, mm -hmm. um, driven by energy. Uh, and would we want a world without access to transportation and choice and telephones and I don't know whether we want to go back to a time before that. Mm. But it was a series of, um, of choices of human behavior that led to more and more particulates of um, carbon going into the air and it broke down the ozone. Um, so that's not a directable thing. It didn't get directed by one person right. or a set of people. And the reverse of that is also not directable. So, director of sustainability, what I do is I try and coordinate. I try and um, work with people in various sectors around campus from facilities to academics, residential halls, dining services, um, mm -hmm. to formulate policies, to have a conversation, to encourage uh, more and more activity that will make the campus more sustainable over the long term, and mo most importantly, to erase student awareness and to provide academic experiences both in and outside the classroom that ask them to make choices in their careers and in their consumerism that leads to uh, a more healthy environment and to uh, hopefully the many, many millions of people in the world will lower the amount of carbon in the air and we'll get to a place where we can survive for another generation. Now, was this a passion of yours before you took on uh, no, responsibility? No, it came from two places. One is um, the Theater Arts Department, the Department of Theater Arts and Dance. It's just polluted, it's just crazy. <laughs> <laughs> no, we did a season of plays about water. Oh, I see. And we created a, a, a campaign around it. We called it Waterworks. We did a season of six projects, two dances, uh, there was a, a couple of operas, uh, short operas that were done in the music department. There were three plays done in, uh, in the theater arts side. One was a new, write, new, uh, new play written by a student. Wow. Um, that talked about drought in Fresno, which is sort of the opposite of waterworks, but we thought it counted. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we invited the campus to hook on to our ad campaign to say if you're doing something about water then let us know and we'll publicize it for it. Coincidentally the School of Science and Technology was doing a symposium, a year-long symposium on water mm -hmm. and other areas around campus said yeah I'm doing this lecture on water, I'm doing this or I have this guest coming on and um, it became a, a year-long thing and it was very powerful. Subsequent yeah. to that, I was asked to be on a committee about sustainability that was just being formed by the provost. And he asked me to speak about our ad campaign, our marketing yeah. campaign. And then he said, well, well, why don't you try being the director of sustainability? Though, in fact, I don't think there were any other people who were interested. <laughs> so um, I said, okay, I'll give it a shot. And that's how I came into it. That's how it happened on that side. And on the passion side, my son was um, applying for high schools and he was asked to write an essay. And he wrote about the Pacific Gyre, which is a right. three mile deep Texas side 
chunk of plastic floating out in the ocean. There right. are three or four of those in the world. And he wanted to write about why that was terrible and what, what had to be done about it. I didn't know it existed. So I started saying to myself, what is it that my son is telling me about the world he's finding himself in? And I ought to get involved in, in that kind of thing. And so the two of them came together at roughly the same time. It's kind of an interesting um, melding of, um, well, an ex really uh, one of the few times we see art doing real impact in real time, you know, uh, on a campus, or maybe not the only time, but a time where it's very explicit in this case. It seems like the art of the productions you were doing that, you know, about water led directly to uh, the sustainability uh, uh, directorship, which you now hold. Well, I think for me, it brought me into that realm of uh, the, the, the university that's a long history of doing things about sustainability. and the work that's being done with the, uh, the Water Agency, with Waste Management Agency. Um, so many of our professors do really great work. They have uh, 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 um, service learning programs out in the community. Mm -hmm. uh, there just wasn't a mechanism for connecting the dots across campus. In fact, the marketing campaign we came up with is called DOT, D-O-T-T, -T, Do One Thing Today. Mm -hmm. And it's about connecting the dots across campus. So yeah. that's what we've been doing in the last couple of years is really saying, there are these things that are occurring across campus. You should be aware of them. You should make other connections. You should uh, see if you can find a way to augment what you're doing in sustainability by working with others. How do you see the future taking shape with the, the crop of kids you work with now, or the students, I should say, uh, you know, this, this particular generation? In what, sustainability or acting? You know, in, let's talk about sustain, sustainability first, and then go in, into what's going to happen more generally with, with acting and that kind of thing. I think our students are so aware, not just our students, but this generation that are 18, are really are 14 to 22 year olds I mean, and even younger than millennials now yeah. oh yeah they are aware of the danger to the earth in a way that um, people my generation still are not I don't think there's a 14 year old a 16 year old who can say uh, climate change is fiction right and they understand that but I think there's also a kind of well what can I do about it this is way beyond me. This is huge. This is a, this is a meteor, a huge meteor coming to Earth, and I can't stop it. I'm not Superman. I'm not Superwoman. There's nothing I can do about it. And so there's a, I, I sense a sort of a, kind of like stuck in the middle. I have this problem. It's going to affect me, but I don't have any control over it. I think that that ramifies in um, this explosive. Um, populist drive in the elections to Bernie Sanders and even Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Two sides of the perspective of both are saying, somebody, somebody take charge, somebody help, somebody make uh, uh, some decisions, and that's really hard because um, they're feeling lost, and I, I see that. On the other hand, I have ac uh, 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 so many actions working with students. Students coming to me and say, can I do this, or will you help with that, or what can we do, or come and watch this guest that we brought to campus. They're out there, they're more and more saying, I will do what I can. Um, there was a student that graduated a couple of years ago, three or four of them got together and they're starting an organic farm. Yeah, they're doing yeah. what they can. Um, and I think the those, it's adding your light to the sun light, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope there's enough of that activity going on. I think that we're getting to a turning point. I read some statistics the other day saying the ozone is actually repairing. Right. So maybe we'll maybe it won't be too late. Maybe it won't be too late. On that note, it's too late for us. We must stop the show. Okay. <laughs> this is seven oh seven and Paul Draper, who is the director of the acting program at Sonoma State University's Department of Theater Arts and Dance. <laughs> Thanks for being on the show. I hope you come back. Thank you. Thanks <laughs> for having me. <laughs> Did I get it right? More or less? Yeah. <laughs> I guess so.